Hi, I'm Rebecca Kennedy and I teach at Denison University and I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about ethnography and empire in Caesar's um, Gallic Wars, specifically passages 6, 11 through 20, which is part of your AP curriculum. What I want to do is I'm going to walk us through um, a discussion of, of various contexts for ways to understand and interpret um, these passages from Caesar's Gallic Wars. We're going to look at the genre, um, think about the purposes of Caesar's text, um, thinking about the history that surrounds the production of this text, and then we'll look at some specific passages um, just to see how you would apply these different contexts to thinking about how Caesar constructs his um, history of the Gauls and his ethnography of the Gauls. So let's start um, by looking at um, what is the literary genre and style of the Gallic Wars. And we have actually four different genres that this falls into. And um, that's, this is something to think about is that a text doesn't have to sit within one specific genre and particularly prose texts tend to stretch over top of other genres. Um, so the first one that we want to recognize is that this is actually a work of propaganda by Caesar for Caesar. Caesar is writing it in the third person, but that doesn't mean that he's an objective observer of his own events. And he's writing this text specifically in order to promote it, uh, his own actions and his goals, um, both while he's in Gaul and for his own political goals while he's uh, back in Rome. Um, second genre that this falls into is something called a commentary. We don't have many extant texts that are commentaries. Caesar's um, BG is probably one of the only ones, but a commentary were basically notes um, or uh, summaries that generals would write up of themselves on campaign. Um, or we also see it of politicians who participated in big events. They might write up notes um, on what they did and how they did it. Um, Cicero, Cicero gave a speech called uh, On My Consulship, which is um, also a type of commentary. And the idea for these commentaries is that they would then be used by historians themselves to actually construct and compose a formal history um, in the Roman sense of the word. So that moves us then, of course, into history as a genre. History um, has a very specific form in ancient Rome. It is both uh, an, an analytic style um, retelling of events year after year after year, um, but it also includes things like set speeches that the author composes, not recordings of actual speeches that were given, but things that the author of the history thinks would have been appropriate to the actors um, in those historical events, and it will contain formal passages explaining the peoples um, and cultures uh, that are in cult, uh, encountered during the course of the history. So they will actually incorporate within a history both um, uh, oratory, uh, as we might understand it, as well as what we call ethnography. So Caesar's text is a propaganda text in that it um, is him writing about his own actions in order to promote his own political um, gains. And, and actions. It's a commentary because he's also recording for other people to use descriptions of the events um, that he participated in as general. It's a history um, partway through. Uh, it doesn't begin as a history. It becomes a history, a more formal history, it seems, over time when Caesar decided to start editing together all of his own texts and start incorporating formal ethnography as well as formal speeches. As many of you may know, Caesar didn't actually ever finish writing the Gallic Wars. Book eight, the final book, was actually written by Aulus Hirtius, and he seems to be the person who compiled the whole text together um, into a single text. Finally, um, the important genre for the passages in book six um, is that this has what we call a formal ethnography. Ethnography, which we'll look at in a second, is actually um, a way that um, someone will describe a, a different culture or people that they encounter, uh, and they will describe different aspects of that people. One of the things to keep in mind is that these genres all vary in how they use the first and the third person. Propaganda can take many forms. It can be in the third person, it can be in the second person, it can also be in the first person. Commentaries tended to be in the first person because it's the, uh, the authority that's invested in those commentaries is that the person who's describing the events is the person who participated in those events. And so you have this idea of uh, the authority of the eyewitness or of the key participant. History tends to be in the third person where the historian like maybe Livy or Tacitus or Sallust um, or on the Greek side Thucydides and Herodotus, they sort of excise themselves and they stand outside of the events and they give an analysis of those events instead. 
ethnography very much um, likes to be positioned from the first person in many ways, or at least at specific moments. It might be written in a third person exposition, uh, but then the author will also insert their own expertise because they witnessed events or they participated um, in actions or they interviewed people who were part of this culture or they saw these actions with their own eyes. So we want to always remember that Caesar is very much playing with this idea of what he's doing by trying to mask his own participation in the events in some ways by pretending that he's writing objectively about himself, Caesar, um, who it turns out, according to Caesar, is the most efficient, effective um, general and bureaucrat in the history of Rome's armies. Uh, but there are going to be a few instances where he inserts the first person, either through a first person verb or through the use of mihi um, in the construction videtor mihi or videntor mihi, um, where he asserts his eyewitness um, authority on the accounts. And those occurrences, there are three of them in the entirety of the Gallic Wars, and they all occur in ethnographic passages. The other context that we want to remember for Caesar's war is that this is, in fact, a war that he manufactured. Um, this was not something that was an ongoing problem that they needed to send a general to. Caesar, as he was about to step out of his consulship, decided that he needed to protect himself, uh, essentially, from being sued or pursued by his creditors um, and other people who were unhappy with the way that he acted in his consulship. So in order to avoid legal um, uh, liability for his actions or being pursued by his creditors, he negotiated with his colleagues a five-year um, term to go and fight in Gaul. Now, this wasn't a very difficult sell for Caesar because the Gauls functioned as something like a boogeyman in Roman history. Uh, and this all dates back to the fourth century BCE. In 390 BC, as Livy Book 5 tells us, the Gauls invaded um, Italy and they sacked Rome. And it was considered a really shameful event for the Romans, and they never sort of forgot it. And this actually informed a lot of their military policy towards their northern neighbors um, for the centuries to follow, including their fears of Hannibal's um, actions uh, during the Hannibalic Wars, um, as well as their willingness to give armies to other generals, like Caesar's uncle Marius in, in a generation earlier, um, to fight against invading or moving German tribes. So Caesar is using these this sort of past of the Romans with the Gauls to manufacture a war that will allow him to have one to to make money he needs to make money desperately uh, and you see um, uh, this quotation from um, Roymans and Fernandez Gertz is actually a discussion of the archaeology of mass destruction and what they've done is they've gone and they've done analysis of the various battlefields and places where Caesar was and they've been able to actually match up the archaeology to the literary text to show that one of Caesar's most important goals in Gaul was to mass enslave population in order to sell them into the eastern slave markets in order to make money to pay off his debts. Uh, his other goal, of course, is to become a very famous and important general, which his propaganda being sent back into Rome would make him very popular with the people. And so military victory after military victory um, is a good way to do that. Um, and so here we see um, Caesar's actions, in fact, almost hedge at times into genocide. Uh, and then finally, obviously, is the political, or, or sorry, um, his decision to use the military as a pathway in order to gain his authority and power um, in Rome uh, and to get that recognition, that actoritas and that dignitas um, that were so very important to him. Okay, so that's our sort of historical context and different literary genres that Caesar's text participates in. The passages that we're going to look at specifically focus in on what we call, are what we call ethnography. And one of the things that you'll see, um, even dating back to our earliest extant ethnography, is that ethnographies all have very specific um, types of information that they carry within them. So for example, political and social organization, marriage and child rearing practices, as well as sexual habits, you'll see this frequently. Religious or ritual practices, defining physical or unique cultural features. One of the things that is often important for noting when our ancient ethnographers are describing people who are foreign to them is that if they don't look different, if they look just the same or look similar enough, they don't tell us what they look like. They only tell us what they look like if there's something weird about them or different. 
So for example, in one of our earliest ethnographic texts by the medical writer Hippocrates, we're told that one group of people up in the Black Sea shaped their heads into cones. Um, this was unusual to the Greeks, and so it was worth noting. Otherwise, they don't tell us uh, about the practices. So we can usually assume if the practice is um, similar uh, to something that the Romans or the Greeks would have done, that they wouldn't have bothered really to describe it. Also, almost always in our ethnographies, they end up by describing unique animals, unique plants and vegetation, and also if there's anything interesting about the topography of the place that makes it different from the location that is normal for the people who are describing them. As I mentioned already, we have an importance of eyewitness accounts uh, being rendered into ethnographies and also the insertion regularly of first person narratives as the thing that grounds the authority of the author. So what about Caesar's sources? Um, Caesar is going to assert himself as um, a first person authority, but he's also gonna be using texts from other people uh, that were written previously who also described the Gauls. So it's gonna be a strange mixture of people who may or may not have seen the Gauls before, texts that were written hundreds of years earlier about the Gauls, um, and Caesar's own interactions with the Gauls. Our primary source that we know of is a guy named Posidonius. He's the guy who, in the passage below here, the quib, uh, uh, quibus dom Graecis is probably referring to Posidonius. Uh, he wrote the most famous account of the Gauls, and we can actually compare Caesar's use of Posidonius to this guy, Diodorus Siculus's use of Posidonius in book five of his history. The other source he uses, obviously, is a geographer named Eratosthenes. What we see important here, though, is this word, wideo. This is, as far as we know, um, the only first person verb used by Caesar to mean Caesar in this text. And what he's doing here is actually correcting and asserting his authority to know better about the, the space that he is describing in his ethnographic passage. And this particular passage comes shortly after the text that is used in your AP curriculum. Um, you only have books uh, six chapters 11 through 20, of chapters 21 through 28 actually describe the Germans and then the landscape animals and plant life um, of, the, of Germany. So this is an important thing to remember, eyewitness, but also using earlier sources. So Caesar's ethnography is gonna be a mixture of these things. Now, what about the context for Caesar's specific ethnography? So they've broken down for you here how you see how Caesar's ethnography fits into the genre. And this is actually how we know very clearly that he's writing to be part of this ethnographic genre. Um, he gives us all of the pieces of information that we would expect uh, for an ethnographic passage. When we talk about some specific passages, I'm going to focus on two passages from social classes and religious practices. Before we start, however, Let's look at the very first sentence of the ethnography, because this actually is a clue that Caesar is giving his readers that you're entering into a formal genre uh, of writing. And this is one of the things that's going to make it clear that he is, in fact, writing a formal history at this stage, because he's going to include a formal ethnography. Uh, this is the first line, quonium ad hunc locum perventum est, non alianum esse videtur de Galliae Germanae Germaniaeque um, moribus et quo differant hae nationes intersese proponere. Right? So Caesar says, we've gotten to a point in my text, right, hunc locum, where it seems to be appropriate, it seems non alienum, it's not wrong to actually talk about and to lay out for his readers who the Gauls and Germans are, what their habits are, and how they differ between themselves. What's going to be really important here is for us to remember that there's a context that he's putting this in. He's decided at this point in his history to stop writing um, about the war and the events and instead to describe these people. Um, but I've put up in parentheses above here um, a bunch of other passages in this text that are also ethnographic passages. They're not big formal ethnographies, but they are all ethnographic passages of the sense that they actually describe everything that Caesar is going to include in 611 through 28 has already been described or at least hinted at or alluded to elsewhere in his text, starting at 1-1 and then again in book four and then again in book five. I want to also make a note here um, 
that what you're actually going to see in this passage is that Caesar is going to be doing something very different than he does in book one. You guys read book one one. And there, I'm gonna come back to this map, you actually see this little map down here in the corner. This is how Caesar describes Gaul. All of Gaul is divided into three parts, right? And he proceeds then to actually tell you about the social structure. Well, the text that he actually lays out for you describes Gaul in these many parts. And all these little names all over these places are all individual tribes that Caesar talks about um, and discusses, tribes and villages. So that when Caesar gets to his formal ethnography, even though in book one, he has already gone through and said, all of Gaul is divided into three parts, and here I'm going to tell you how that works. What he actually then does is he redivides Gaul and redivides the culture of the Gauls in a way that fits in with his vision of who the Gauls are. And importantly, he's going to say that all of Gaul is structured around the idea of factions. Um, we're going to come back to why that is important, but it is, in fact, very important to understand Caesar structuring our Gauls as if they are part of a faction. So how, with this sort of information, knowing that we're heading into a formal ethnographic passage, and also knowing that Caesar is writing this work as part of a propaganda piece, as part of a commentary, as part of history, um, and as part of his strategy to win the war and to improve his political and economic fortunes, how do we then analyze the ethnographic passages? So there's two things that you want to keep in mind. The first is that ethnographic uh, passages often function by displaying non-Romans as other, right? This idea is that these are people who don't share Roman practices or ideals. Um, that's a very standard ethnography, especially if the people you're describing are people who are so different from you that you don't really have much interaction with them. However, we also want to think about ethnography as a two-way mirror. Right? That two-way mirror allows us to see both the other, right? so we see how the Romans view other people, but it also reflects backwards onto themselves so that we can see through that practice what are the values that Romans themselves hold and how they see it operating in conjunction with other cultures. The second thing we want to think about is that Caesar's particular ethnography is an actual act of conquest and empire because it is part of um, his propaganda and because he is writing uh, about this war that he himself is conducting, we have to understand that the writing is actually integral to his own vision of his success in the war. Um, ethnographic writings often are the result of conquests, and a, a parallel example that Caesar himself may have been thinking of is Alexander the Macedonian. When he went to India um, and, and conquered most of Asia, he actually brought people with him whose job it was to observe and to write about the cultures that they encountered. And so we have a whole bunch of texts from Caesar's, or for, sorry, from Alexander's own generals that are of Indian culture um, in antiquity. So one of the things we wanna think about is when Caesar is writing about the, call, the Gauls, he's gonna sort the Gauls for us into Gauls who need to be eliminated and Gauls who need to be assimilated um, because he is actually going to, as part of his process, assimilate a bunch of Gauls into Roman citizenship and eventually into the Roman Senate. Uh, so one of the things we're going to think about is those Gauls who are presented as other and as very foreign and as bad, um, those are the Gauls that Caesar sees as okay to eliminate. The Gauls that he says are kind of like Romans, they just need Romans to help them become better Romans. These are the Gauls that he's going to assimilate and that is a sort of standard practice of Roman imperialism in the period. Um, and just to give you a context for what I mean about Gauls who are set to be eliminated versus Gauls who are set to be assimilated, um, according to the historian Apian, who wrote about 100 years after Caesar and had both Caesar's text and a bunch of other sources to work with, he wrote a history of Gaul. And according to him, Caesar killed approximately 1 million Gauls, enslaved another 1 million Gauls, um, out of a total population of 4 million. Now, we always have to take numbers <laughs> in our ancient historians with a grain of salt, that there probably were, there may have may or may not have been millions of people involved, but it was at least tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who were involved um, in Caesar's conquest and who suffered direct dire consequences from his actions um, or direct benefits from his actions. Because after Caesar gains power in Rome, important thing to remember is that Caesar expanded the Senate by something like 300 people and added a bunch of people who had been Gauls who he had made Roman citizens as part of um, the process. 
So now that we've been thinking about these things, let's look at a couple of passages just to sort of think about alienation versus assimilation. So the first thing we wanna look at are the, the, the Gallic equites. Gauls have equites, did you know this? The Gauls probably didn't know this. The Gauls probably thought they had warriors of some sort in a language that Caesar doesn't like, um, which is Celtic, right? So Caesar actually tells us uh, at the beginning of his ethnography that there are only two types of people who matter um, in Gallic society. Um, the plebs, he says, don't matter, but in Gallic society, there are two kinds. There are druids and there are equites. The equites are given a Roman name. You know, of course they didn't call themselves equites, uh, but he gives them a Roman name and then he's going to give them a Roman structure. He says they have clients, which is something that the Romans would have understood. And they also function um, it, with a desire to increase their gratia and their potentia. Um, these are things that are very key values for Romans that they would understand the importance of. But Caesar also tells us that before Caesar got there, they were always fighting with each other and they couldn't really integrate properly. So we have a text, a passage right here, which assimilates Gauls to Roman social categories, situates them within um, the function of Roman political values, and then explains how they used to not be able to function properly, but now that Caesar is here, Caesar can fix it for them. And this is important to remember because Caesar's propaganda is going home and he's not just saying, I can make Gauls into Romans, certain Gauls into Romans, but he's also reminding a Rome that's in extreme turmoil right now that he can also fix what ails Rome and make Rome function better too. So while we think about one social group, the equites who get to be um, part of the Roman superstructure, the other group of note gets rejected. And here is where the language matters as well because what Caesar does with the Gallic equites is he makes Gallic warriors and turns them into something that a Roman audience would find familiar, knights. The word druid, however, is a, is, is a Celtic word. It is not a Roman word. And Caesar finds it difficult to find a Roman word that it directly translates to the druids because they're not a senatorial class. They're a ritual class, a religious caste, and they are also teachers and educators. Uh, and this is something that is foreign and alien to the Roman audience and to Caesar himself. And the Druids are also one of the groups within Gallic society that he seeks actively to eradicate because they are rivals and da a danger to his ability to assimilate Gauls into um, Rome's empire. So here you see the assertion of the word Druid multiple times um, within the text. Also importantly um, is that in passage 15, which I don't have on here, um, this is one of the other instances, both times that Caesar uses the phrase Wendentor or Wedetor Mihi, where he uses Mihi to refer to himself as author, are when he's talking about the Druids. And what he does is he actually says, the Druids do this thing. You guys don't understand why they do it, but it seems to me that they're doing it for this reason. So he's asserting his authority and he's asserting his ability to understand and interpret the Druids' actions. And that is how he knows that the Druids are not to, to be Romanized. Um, the passage that follows this one is really uh, one of the most uh, famous and um, important passages um, from Caesar's ethnography in which he describes the process by which um, the Druids burn alive uh, criminals uh, in a giant wicker man, um, which I'm sure you guys will enjoy reading about. But um, this is a practice that Caesar highlights as being completely inappropriate and, and, and evil um, insofar as a Roman would be concerned. And so he doesn't incorporate the Druids into Roman language because he doesn't want to incorporate the Druids into Roman um, society. However, this doesn't mean that all of Gauls and Gallic religion is unassimilatable or unrecognizable. In passage 17, he goes through a whole situation where he takes every god that he sees the Gauls um, recognizing or worshiping, and he gives them a Roman equivalent. So we have Mercury, Apollo, Mars, Minerva, and Jove. Um, all of them get to be Gallic gods too. This is something that we call syncretism, and this is really common. The Romans do this everywhere else, right? So Druids bad. Druids can't be assimilated. This is why they don't get a Roman word for them or a Roman equivalent for them. But the Gauls, generally speaking, can be, a, a, uh, once you get rid of the Druids and their rituals, you can understand, a Roman can understand their rituals by incorporating their gods into the Roman 
um, God's structure. All right, which brings us to the end, um, something to think about. Uh, when you are reading uh, a text like Caesar's, you always have to remember that there are uh, many purposes that go into a text like this. It is not an objective text, even though Caesar is writing about the actions that he commits um, as if he is um, not the person doing it, right? Caesar does X, Caesar does Y. Um, we have to remember that Caesar is writing this, but we also have to remember that Caesar didn't think that what he was doing was bad. He didn't think that mass enslavement or that genocide were bad things. They are a necessary, he viewed it as a necessary part of Rome's expansion, and it is where um, we can actually see um, how the Romans conceived of their own activities, uh, or at least some Romans conceived of their own activities out in the world. Um, as Roymans and Fernandez Gertz remind us, Caesar himself explains that one of his goals with at least some of the tribes he encountered was to, in fact, annihilate and erase them and their name from history. Some people say that because the Romans or Caesar or others were very open about their actions, that we can't use modern judgments um, to say that they were committing genocide or other actions that we would find reprehensible. But there were other Romans back in Rome, people like Cicero and others, who looked at what Caesar did and saw that what Caesar did was in fact not a good thing um, and that um, he was doing it for personal gain. Um, and so we do have evidence um, from other Romans that what Caesar's campaign, his nine year long campaign in Gaul um, of manufacturing a war in order to uh, improve his own political and economic situation was something that can be judged um, as an act of genocide uh, and as an act of mass um, destruction of a society and culture. Uh, but we have, I guess, to thank Caesar because Caesar's Gallic Wars and these passages from book six are in fact some of the only descriptions that we have from antiquity at all that actually describe Druids and other practices um, of the ancient Gauls. Um, and maybe that's a bad thing um, because we've viewed Druids and others from ancient Gaul almost exclusively through the perspective of Caesar's lens for 2000 years, but otherwise we would only have his, uh, we'd have no written text and only the archaeological evidence, which can't always um, fit it all together and give us a clean story. So here are some further readings that you can look at for understanding um, both the nature of Caesar's texts as well as um, the nature of ethnography, his ethnography specifically, and other representations of foreigners in the ancient world. Um, I hope that you got something out of this video that you will be able to use in order to help you to interpret and analyze Caesar's texts um, and pay attention to the language that he's using to understand how he's trying to present his own actions, um, as well as uh, the people of Gaul and reflected back um, the values of, of himself and other Romans uh, in his text. Thank you very much.